welcome. We've reached the uh, DDOT's positive truck signage study public meeting. Uh, we'll give it a few minutes for, for uh, attendees to join, but you have indeed come to the right place. So um, we will start shortly. We'll give it one more minute before we start, just to let folks join this um, DDOT positive truck route signage study public meeting. Well, this is Laura McNeil. I'm um, the freight program manager at the District Department of Transportation, and I think we'll just get started um, for this public meeting and uh, we'll let others join um, as they as they can. We will start off with a few housekeeping uh, tips about this WebEx platform. So I'll turn um, I'll turn over to my colleague, Mama So, to walk us through those WebEx logistics. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So first, we'd like to go over some WebEx functions on uh, general housekeeping rules. As Laura has indicated, um, all attendees will be muted during the presentation. If you have a question during the presentation, you may send that via the question and answer panel and we'll go over how to do that momentarily. All questions will be addressed after the presentation in a question and answer session. If you have any technical issues during the meeting, please call 202-997-8354, and this meeting will be recorded. Next slide, please. All right, so on to audio and video settings. So the project team are the only ones with video capability for the duration of the meeting for quality and bandwidth purposes. Participants will have the option to ask their questions verbally, again, at the end of the presentation using the raise hand feature. Next slide, please. For question and answer via phone and browser. So please note that only web and app users will be able to send questions using the question and answer panel during the presentation. Unfortunately, this feature is not available for those who have dialed into the presentation by phone. For web and app users, you can access the question and answer panel by clicking on the question mark icon at the bottom of your screen. If the question mark icon is not available at the bottom of your screen, please select the three dot icon and you will be directed to the 
question and answer panel. When using the question and answer panel, please ensure that you've selected all participants in the ask field. After you type in your question, when you're ready to send it, hit enter. Next slide, please. Finally, with the raise hand function, so this will be used at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session to ask verbal questions. For web and app users, click on the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. For those who have called in via phone to raise your hand, dial star three. This will alert the project team that you wish to speak and one of our moderators will unmute you to ask your question. All verbal questions will be limited to three minutes. And with that, I'll pass it back to Laura to introduce the project team. Thanks so much, uh, Mamso. I am hoping that um, my audio is is okay. Um, if not, then I might ask our um, IT host if if there's anything that we can do to improve the audio um, for the presentation. I should start by letting you know that I am a person here. Um, my name is Laura McNeil. I am the DDOT project manager for this project, and I'm the um, freight program manager uh, at the District Department of Transportation. With me is my colleague Florence Dwyer, who's the deputy project manager. Um, and uh, the other project team members uh, include K.R. Marshall, who works for WSP, the consultants for this project, along with Stephanie Finch, who will be uh, presenting some of the slides today. Holly Chase, who is a subconsultant on this project, working with Sam Schwartz. Um, Shoma Day, also from Sam, Sam Schwartz, and Alex Webb. So everyone here will be able to answer questions and participate in the presentation. Um, or, or, or respond to questions as they've all worked on uh, this study. Uh, the agenda today will start with a positive truck route signage, uh, what it is, an overview of this study, a quick um, rundown of existing conditions, a, a gap analysis, um, benefit cost analysis, a transition plan, route recommendations, and next steps. So these are the elements of the agenda that we'll be talking about today. And we'll start off with what positive and negative truck signage is, just in, in concept. Positive truck route signage is installed along truck routes, letting uh, drivers know in a positive way, in an affirmative way, that they are on the correct route, that indeed trucks are intended on this, on this road, um, affirming that this is where they should be. Negative truck route signage is what is typically seen in the District of Columbia, which identifies where trucks are prohibited or restricted or where through truck uh, <clears throat> travel might be restricted. And uh, it, it's an, a negative um, restrictive signage. In, um, and then moving to the next slide, well, I'll show you in the existing, in the existing conditions in DC, um, You'll notice that we have many truck restriction signs um, and no signs where we have truck routes. Uh, indeed, our truck routes are, are mapped and um, identified in, in, yeah, and mostly in maps, but they don't have signs along the routes um, as you're traveling along them, indicating where you, that this is an, a designated roadway. These designated roadways are advisory. Uh, trucks and buses are encouraged to travel along these roadways that we have identified as most appropriate for them, but they are not required to stay on them. Um, they are required to stay off of through truck restricted roadways in the district unless they're making a local delivery. And those restrictions are enforced by our partners in the Metropolitan Police Department and through um, our automated traffic enforcement unit using uh, cameras. 
Currently, trucks carry more than 90% of the goods uh, that come in to the district by weight and uh, over 72 of all the goods received uh, and traveling through the district by value. So most of our goods come in and out through truck. As I mentioned, you in the, in the District of Columbia, you might be seeing um, a variety of negative or uh, restrictive truck and bus signage. They come in a variety of designs, um, but they usually say a similar message. Um, trucks are defined uh, on signs as being over two axles or over one and one fourth ton capacity. And typically, uh, th truck restrictions are, are through truck restrictions. Um, and then bus restrictions are uh, absolute bus restrictions, unless there are exceptions for the type of bus in question. The signs that have a green background and white writing are, in fact, wayfinding or advisory signage. They're not enforceable or, or technically restrictive signage. So they play more of uh, an advisory role where trucks should not be. Moving on. Which brings us to what this study is um, looking to, to better understand and, and uh, provide findings about. We are looking to analyze the benefits and drawbacks of potentially installing those positive truck route signs in the district uh, with the goal of balancing quality of life with res for residents and the need to make deliveries both for businesses and residents. So the, the study is starting off by evaluating our existing bus and truck network, which, as I mentioned, is advisory with enforceable restrictions on residential roads. The study is also looking at peer cities that have positive truck route signage networks. And we conducted uh, an analysis uh, looking at the benefits and the costs of installing positive truck route signage under two different scenarios or two different contexts. One, keeping our advisory system where uh, trucks and buses are encouraged but not required to stay on bus routes or truck routes. And then in another context where it's a mandatory truck route or bus route system where trucks and buses are required to stay on truck routes unless they're making a local delivery. And so um, under those two contexts, we looked at the benefits and the costs that might um, come out of come out of positive truck route signage. The study also is looking at the components needed to make a potential transition plan, any legal, administrative, or enforcement, or public engagement actions that the district would need to invest in if it were to implement positive truck route signage under either of those um, contexts, advisory or mandatory systems. And lastly, it is creating a concept plan with design, design materials and guidelines in order to create cost estimates to understand the benefit cost ratio of moving forward with um, this type of signage. From here, I believe, oh, one more thing, I think. This, uh, this study is also looking to get public um, and stakeholder input. And stakeholder perspectives are essential to building a complete and accurate, comprehensive and accurate understanding of existing conditions, concerns, um, and any trends in the local trucking environment that may be important to the study. The goals for this outreach are to supplement the technical analysis that we are conducting, to gather perspectives on the effectiveness of the existing advisory framework, to provide an opportunity to discuss the potential opportunities and concerns for a mandatory route framework and to inform a potential transition plan if we were to move forward with positive truck route signage under a mandatory route framework. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my WSP colleague, Stephanie Finch, to lead us through some of the study findings. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, can I please ask our IT host to uh, show my video? I seem to have lost that functionality as the screen sharer. I assume other folks can't see me. You're oh. currently you're just a name on the screen, but <laughs> 
just the name. All right, well, I'll go on and uh, hopefully our IT hosts can uh, show my screen if possible as we move forward. Uh, so I'm Stephanie Finch. I'm a freight planner with the consultant firm WSP. Uh, we're working with Sam Schwartz uh, as our uh, co-team with DDOT uh, on the positive truck signage study. So this is a one year long study that began last September. Uh, and as Laura said, we started with evaluating existing conditions, researching peer cities uh, and existing truck and bus frameworks, completing our cost benefit analysis, transition plan, um, developing conceptual plans and cost estimates, and coming up with overall recommendations and findings. Um, and so we're about a couple months out from the end of the study and uh, the stakeholder outreach uh, component here is absolutely crucial to the findings. Uh, one of the things that we examined was previous studies. DDOT has done a significant amount of work uh, researching the truck system and looking into what is the best way to manage truck traffic throughout the district. In 2010, the city had, uh, established an advisory truck route system of the designated, uh, though unsigned routes. So that's the, the basis of the routes that you'll see out there today. Uh, in 2016, DDOT updated the truck restriction guidelines and the review process. So that's how the truck restrictions on the local roads are, are made. Uh, and in 2020, DDOT completed its freight plan addendum. Uh, the freight plan is a required document for federal funding. Uh, DDOT is also currently completing an updated freight plan. Uh, folks are interested in that. Uh, and some of the findings from the 2020 addendum uh, were that there are definitely challenges in the district um, where land uses and transportation are changing faster than that underlying infrastructure. Uh, and there are also vertical clearance restrictions throughout the district. And one of the recommendations from the addendum was a comprehensive signage program uh, that can help drivers easily identify the designated routes and minimize illegal truck traffic that has an impact on local neighborhoods. Uh, there's uh, a lot of components that went into the overall study in each of the um, sort of subsections that we mentioned earlier. We used uh, publicly available DDAT data from uh, the district's open data site. We used um, the previous plans and studies, as I mentioned. We conducted stakeholder outreach um, in the winter uh, of 2022. Uh, we looked at existing conditions, connectivity, roadway characteristics, traffic, um, and a lot of pieces to make sure that we're getting the full picture of how truck traffic is currently functioning in the district. Uh, so as I mentioned, input from stakeholders was crucial uh, in the first Part of this study. Um, in the winter, we conducted two interview sessions with truck and bus uh, industry stakeholders. And we also sent a survey to the advisory neighborhood commissions uh, who came back with a tremendous response of uh, nearly 200 responses. We also interviewed the Metropolitan Police Department's motor carrier safety unit uh, for their perspective on enforcement and truck traffic. Uh, and we also interviewed National Park Services representative. And you'll see the little graphic from the survey here uh, with the survey question, would you support a mandatory bus and truck route framework uh, at the, from the ANC survey? And the answer was a resounding yes. Uh, and to dive a little bit deeper into the ANC survey responses, um, many folks were not aware that the district actually has current truck routes and restrictions, um, or it's not clear to them what those are. Uh, and there were concerns about inadequate enforcement, oversized trucks blocking streets, uh, and the effect of large trucks on safety. A uh, key component of the study was an analysis of existing conditions, and uh, we'll call this some of the, the gap analysis for some of the next slides. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that went into this methodology. First of all, we identified corridor gaps in the current through route network. Um, if you were to look at the current map of the through route network, there's small gaps in there in connectivity. So we looked at um, uh, what, what those are and can we rectify that. Uh, we developed a composite truck connectivity index. And this is a lot of words to say, we took in data to see, uh, evaluate every 
road segment in the district for its appropriateness for truck travel based on uh, some factors I'll get in here. Uh, and then we compared the results of that index with the current designated truck routes. Uh, so some of the variables that were considered for the connectivity index were truck volumes uh, from district data and from uh, a private data source to verify each other uh, from current roadway restrictions, uh, including restrictions in existing roadway geometry, turn restrictions and truck prohibitions. We looked at safety data, uh, truck involved, truck and commercial vehicle involved crashes uh, throughout the district, demographics. Um, we evaluated whether uh, routes or potential routes would be going through residential neighborhoods, um, institutional land uses, or uh, recreational land uses. We looked at the functional classifications of roads, uh, and that's a way of saying what type of road is this? Is this a, a narrow local road that's meant for light traffic, or is this uh, an interstate, say, that is um, engineered for heavy truck traffic? Uh, and so some of the findings from the existing conditions analysis was that, in fact, most truck traffic is on interstates and expressways in the district. Uh, to the tune of 85% of uh, single unit truck uh, traffic is actually on the existing truck and bus through network. Uh, and 78% of combination truck. Uh, so that would be like a tractor trailer combo. 78% uh, of that traffic is on the current truck and bus through network, which um, on this map on the slide is the green lines. That's the existing uh, network. Uh, but we also found that 30% of that truck volume is um, on roads and neighborhoods with a medium household income of uh, $50,000 or less. Uh, and that truck traffic in low volume neighborhoods uh, is occurring on expressways, um, especially the 295 corridor. Uh, but on the other hand, even though most, most truck traffic is on interstates and the through network, uh, most of the truck signage this restriction signage is on local streets. Uh, so that analysis also highlighted some potential impacts of positive truck signage, that is, again, signing the designated through routes. Uh, we would estimate that uh, truck travel would shift to roads better equipped to accommodate trucks, uh, wider roads, um, not local streets, arterial roads. Um, we would we would estimate that there would be a reduction a reduction in trucks ad adjacent to residential land uses. So we would estimate that a positively signed truck network would take trucks out of uh, neighbor residential neighborhoods uh, with an attendant reduction in localized air pollution. Uh, we think there would be a negligible change to trucks uh, adjacent to institutional and recreational land uses, and we think that um, a positive truck routing system could help channel truck traffic, uh, as I mentioned, along those primary arterial, arterials, which would benefit communities with median household incomes of $50,000 to $100,000. Uh, and the chart on this slide shows um, the, the fact I talked about in the last slide. Um, if you look at the bar graph to the furthest left, this is um, road segments in neighborhoods with a median household income of $50,000 or less. And, and those neighborhoods have 16% of all the roadway mileage in the district, but they account for 30% of the truck traffic. Um, and there's also a difference in neighborhoods with uh, 50 to 100,000, where the truck traffic sort of exceeds um, their percentage of the roads. So a few takeaways from the overall analysis uh, are that the current truck and bus through network provides an adequate base for a positively signed network with some changes, um, that a positively signed network should be extensive to reduce circuitous trips of uh, drivers taking a lot of uh, side detours to try to stay on through routes, uh, that a positive truck route signing with a mandatory enforcement framework uh, would significantly reduce truck VMT in sensitive areas. That is, uh, if enforcement were to occur based on uh, signs on the uh, through route network. Um, and that a positively signed network with a mandatory enforcement framework 
could also reduce the burden on residents to have to request those uh, truck restrictions in their own neighborhoods. Uh, and just a reminder here, we're going through a lot of content. So um, if you have questions while we're presenting, please feel free to put those in the Q&A so that we can address them after the presentation. So now we'll move into the benefit cost analysis that was conducted for this study. Uh, as Lauren mentioned early on, we were looking at two primary, uh, what we call build scenarios in a cost benefit analysis. Um, the goal here is to analyze uh, what are the current operations, that's the as is condition, and compare it against um, some potential options for, uh, for a project. So one would be a, what we call a build advisory network. Uh, and in this scenario, the district adopts positive truck signage on its through routes, uh, but it also retains the signage on the current local road restrictions. Uh, so it's essentially would be maintaining a double signage system. Um, and then we also analyzed the build mandatory scenario where uh, the district would put up signs on the positively signed through route network, and then they would remove the majority of the local restriction signs uh, because they would only be enforcing, say, on the through route network. Uh, some signs, some restriction signs would need to be maintained, especially those uh, for geometric concerns like uh, vertical clearance issues. Uh, the findings of the cost benefit analysis were that um, we would expect in the advisory scenario where the district would have to maintain both sets of signs, uh, that there would be a, a higher operations and maintenance costs, uh, that there would be a positive benefit to the to the district sort of saving uh, money in operations and maintenance for the mandatory system where they would only need to maintain one set of signs. Uh, we think that driver travel time impacts would remain neutral um, as drivers are generally already finding their most, most efficient routes. And so while they might be pushed towards um, routes where they can go a bit faster on those primary arterials, they may have to take a few extra turns here and there to stay on the through network and off of local streets. Um, we think that the safety benefits um, could be positive with different assumptions. Uh, part of the analysis here was impacted by data availability um, and an unknown shift in uh, vehicle miles traveled by trucks. Ultimately, it's very difficult to determine uh, how that truck travel travel would shift um, with a positively signed system. Uh, emissions, vehicle operating costs, and pavement damage damage uh, we expect might all. Um, increase in the negative sense a bit as trucks have to take slightly more circuitous uh, routes to stay on the through routes and off of local streets. Uh, so for the transition plan, this was sort of a different type of analysis of this project. This um, would lay it, this plan lays out a template um, for the district. What would need to happen uh, in terms of policy, enforcement and other things uh, for positive truck route signage to be implemented. Uh, so what policies uh, in the city code might need to be changed? Um, what sort of efforts um, in conjunction with Metropolitan Police Department would need to be conducted? Um, who would need to be informed about a transition to, um, to a positive truck signage framework? Uh, and how would be the best ways to reach out to them? Um, We'll talk a little bit about more, more about this in the coming slides. Uh, truck route recommendations. Uh, what's a what's a schematic of a potential uh, positively signed truck through route network? And following that, an installation and maintenance plan for uh, such potential signage. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Shumi Day from Sam Schwartz Engineering to discuss the route recommendations and signage plans. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so in terms of the route recommendations, uh, what we started off with is the existing uh, truck route network that uh, DC already has. And on top of that, we super superimpose the gap analysis that uh, st uh, that Stephanie talked about. Um, and then obviously we uh, use some engineering judgment uh, to make sure that uh, the, the truck the truck route positive uh, the positive truck routes uh, make uh, make sense and is the most effective in terms of uh, origin destination pairs and um, and connections. 
So uh, the final result was uh, the map on the right here. So the red uh, lines here are the existing truck network and the blue ones are essentially the additions that were made uh, based on the things that I talked about, the gap analysis, some engineering judgment uh, and knowledge about uh, truck routes. Uh, so, uh, so we have the network in place. If we go to the next slide, we created a framework yeah, uh, kind of a model on how do we now, now that we have the system, how do we uh, sign it, right? So the signs fall in two big buckets. The first one is kind of letting people know what the uh, what the rule is, right? So that's kind of at uh, whenever somebody crosses from uh, Maryland into DC, letting them know that trucks and buses are supposed to use truck routes. So that's the first group of signs at entry points to the district. And then the second group of signs is actually the active truck, the positive truck route signage, letting people know that once you are on a truck route, uh, kind of giving them feedback that where they are in the system. Um, uh, so the business rule was whenever two truck routes intersect, we would have uh, signage. And then for longer routes, we would reinforce the signage every half a mile. So those were the business rules and uh, the framework that we used for signing the system that we talked about in the previous slide. So the result of all of that was, um, if you can go to the next slide, it gives you a count of the, oh, it gives you the type of sign. So this is uh, the truck route signage. Uh, the size would be based on the speeds uh, of the, the posted speed limit on the truck routes based on MUTCD standards. Uh, and then uh, the next slide talks about the total number of signs. Uh, so we are talking about uh, around 2,300 signs at over 440 locations. And the map on the right shows the different kind of signage and the uh, locations of each. And, and in terms of specific installation of the signage, uh, they would be installed within 100 to 200 feet of an intersection. And to the extent possible, we would use existing assets such as U posts or street lights to put up the signs. So, so the idea would be to put up these 2,300 signs uh, as efficiently as we can. So with that, I will turn it back uh, over to Laura. Thanks, Shama. So for our next steps, we, uh, for the study, we are looking to incorporate feedback from public industry and government stakeholders, um, complete the deliverables of this truck route signage study, um, finalize truck route recommendations, develop the plan specifications and engineers estimate for positive truck route signage, develop a positive truck route map, branding and signage design potential truck map, uh, positive truck route map. And, uh, to, to understand the components of that potential transition plan. And then to share these study deliverables back with the public and industry and government stakeholders uh, to determine um, next steps and, and any future potential investments based on these study findings. Next slide. Oh, and there I am. Contact information. So I think this is the time where we might. Um, oh, well, we will be posting these slides and a recording of this meeting on the DDOT website um, that you see linked here. It's um, basically getting, you go to the DDOT homepage, it says getting around, you choose freight, you land on the commercial vehicles page. And that's where you'll find um, information about this study and this meeting and these slides. We will um, also receive comments and feedback through email, my email in particular, um, but also we have a freight program um, that several email that you see here that several people will be um, reviewing and making sure uh, we receive and respond to those questions. Um, sent to the, the programmatic email as well. I think in the next slide, we might go through ah, the Q and a session. Um, so this is, this is the opportunity to uh, raise your hand, um, or, uh, write, um, a question in the Q and a chat and we will go through those questions. And again, if, um, 
you have additional questions or would like to speak longer, then there's an opportunity to to reach out to me and uh, you know we can we can discuss further beyond the scope of this meeting. So, just as a reminder, um, please click on the question mark icon at the bottom of your screen to access that Q and A panel. Select the option "Ask All Panelists." Type your question in, and then press enter. Press enter uh, to submit. And then um, for verbal questions, we will limit them to about three minutes to allow um, enough an opportunity for everyone to speak. And um, and again, if the conversation is longer than that. There's an opportunity to uh, speak with me or email me, and then we can um, discuss further through that mechanism. So, to click on the icon for web and app users, uh, you can see it um, at the bottom of your screen as the icon. If you're dialing in, dial star three, and that will indicate um, online that you have raised your hand, and we will um, oh we will call on you. I will also uh, introduce my colleague Florence to help moderate this discussion. So, um, I think. We yeah, just yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Pause the presentation quick and try to share my video and then. Um, yeah, sorry, Florence, you're going to. Work to get the questions answered here. Yes, thanks for the presentation. And now we will start with the questions that have been coming in. So, first question that has come in, uh, why can't this be integrated into various mapping and G GPS systems that drivers use? And this was in reference to the slide on the proposed uh, route recommendations. Great question. That is a work in progress. Um, we do have conversations with mapping services um, to let them know our roadway designations. Um, however, Waze and Google um, do not route for commercial vehicles. Um, if you're routing for a commercial vehicle in particular, there are uh, dimension concerns and weight concerns that need to be factored in, and those are specialized systems that commercial fleets use. So what, what standard drivers use to navigate is not sufficient for commercial vehicle fleets. And those commercial vehicle fleets do have um, uh, an understanding of where route restrictions are through um, their sort of data source mechanisms. But increasing knowledge of where trucks should and should be is an ongoing conversation. And so, um, fair point. It's one we're continuing. Thanks, Laura. Um, the next question Has this been coordinated with WMATA's Better Bus Visionary Plan, which suggests placing more buses on residential streets, example, 4th Street Northeast, F Street Northeast, et cetera? Great point. Um, the, and I think one that's really worth bearing um, and highlighting is that this truck and bus network, when we say bus, we're really talking about tourist motor coaches, transit buses, um, and to some degree commuter buses, though that is something that we are definitely, um, these are not, these, are, these provide services that are negotiated um, between uh, transit companies and are not, would not operate under these rules. Um, it's really looking at the tourist and private motor coaches where they can and, and, and should not be. So there's a different vetting process for the commuter bus routes and the transit bus routes, and that would not be through this particular um, framework. It would be under a different vetting system between government officials or transit agencies. And there is ongoing coordination with WMATA for this study. Great. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, what is the current problem with the signage? 
Is it that it's not clear enough or that trucks consistently violate the rules? There are multiple problems uh, that we are trying to address under the current framework. Um, the current framework, there is a problem of um, signs that are inconsistent in design, um, perhaps not as clearly designed um, or easy to pick out among all the options of signs that we have in the district. We have um, something called sign clutter that we, we, we strive to, to reduce so that and the important messages stand out. Um, and another problem is um, many times the, the notification of a truck restriction is past the decision point. So there isn't that advance notice to uh, let um, truck drivers know that they need to be making alternative route decisions to stay, to stay off of a truck restriction. So these are constraints that we um, understand and um, are working to address. But there's also a lot of local roads in the district that are not appropriate for trucks. And putting up a sign on every local road is a burden not just to the District of Columbia to um, assess, install, and maintain, but also to uh, the communities that uh, under our current framework uh, are required to request that, to request that their, their street be assessed uh, for um, a, a truck route restriction. And so for both of those reasons and ongoing, um, the idea that every local road or every residential street would need to be signed um, may not be ideal in the long term. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what about weight restrictions? How will that be addressed? Great question. Um, we currently address weight through several mechanisms. Um, there is uh, basically there's a certain threshold that if you're a legal load, most infrastructure is built to sustain a legal load and there are technicalities about how um, vehicles are configured and what the weight is on each individual axe that can, constitutes what a legal load is. There are certain bridges that are due to heavy wear and tear or um, you know, old age, unable to sustain certain legal loads, and those are posted for a certain weight. And those you might see um, on the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge um, recently that there is a posted weight. So the 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 weight um, signage and limitations are managed um, so like our vertical clearance. Like if there's a low bridge, those are managed consistently and would be a constant through whichever framework um, we we continue or we we have in the future. And um, and those are. Those sort of operate on a on a separate parallel, but unaffected system of notification and um, signage. I see that there's a sign saying or a question about currently weight is the mechanism of enforcement and. That speaks to some of the challenges of our existing uh, framework in that 1 and 1 4 ton capacity is not a weight. Um, measurement, it is really a size. It is the, the size of a vehicle. How much uh, capacity uh, can it um, accommodate? So the any vehicle is easily more than one and one fourth ton in terms of weight, like your, your mini car, your Chevrolet Spark is easily two tons in and of itself. So the, the, the the confusing element of our current restriction signage is that it's really trying to get at size rather than a weight designation. Again, something we're looking to address um, potentially by um, clarifying in our regulations what a truck is so that we don't have to describe it on the sign itself. Great, thanks for that clarification, Laura. Um, 
Next, uh, we see that Kelly Cicillo has a hand raised. So Kelly, we're going to unmute you now for you to ask your question. So go ahead. You may have just muted yourself by accident. All right, now I'm unmuted. Yeah, I put the questions in the chat if you want to read them from there. Okay. Okay. Sure, well, no problem. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. All right, we will continue down with the questions then. Um, the next one, can you clarify if the recommendation is to remove most of the negative truck route signs? So the benefit cost analysis portion of this study was looking at um, what made what would be the impacts of um, installing positive truck route signage um, under the existing advisory system or under uh, a mandatory system. And the short answer to your question is um, it doesn't well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to take on the burden both for residents and the agency to put signs on potentially every street in the district, whether it's a truck route or a truck restriction sign. Um, it, it would it would compound sign clutter and um, it would um, double the amount of um, maintenance and installation um, needed to maintain both systems at the same time. So, um, if we, the study finding concluded that a positive truck route signage um, plan really made most sense under a mandatory truck route framework. And under a mandatory truck route framework, we would walk away from restriction signs unless they were, let's say, National Park Service roads or leading into some sort of specialized in infrastructure. And, um, and we would rely on the positive truck route signage to be the means of enforcing um, trucks to stay on those routes. If a truck was not on the uh, designated mandatory truck route, MPD, our enforcement partners, would be uh, within their rights to question that vehicle to make sure that they were uh, making a local delivery and not cutting through a residential street. They would need to have a sign in place on that resi residential street to to make that stop and ask those questions because the signs are enforced for the positive truck route sign um positive truck route network also i want to let um stephanie please feel free to jump in with anything that i've either misspoken or uh, miss um you know failed to mention it for any of these questions All right, moving to the next question. Um, has anyone considered allowing trucks to use dedicated bus lanes? Could it help traffic flow faster? Stephanie, I don't believe our study looked at that exactly. Um, I will say um, on the DDOT side, we have thought about that that is is that is under consideration um it is a question of um wanting to be sure that the right circumstances are in place and so that it wouldn't have a um a negative impact on transit service which the bus lane is intended to provide so um at the moment there is uh, an, an interest in better understanding where and when that might be an effective tool but there is um, the sort of the strong mandate to make sure that transit is the priority and that by doing so, we wouldn't negatively impact the bus service that we're trying to improve. Okay, and the next question is, has the human experience been included in the study? I'm not sure if um, Elise is able to uh, unmute herself to perhaps provide a little context for that question. Sure, I can go ahead and unmute her now.
Elise, if you'd like to speak, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, well, I'm on an iPad, so it's a little bit different than um, what you guys showed. What I meant was, um, I, and I'm gonna use a specific street as you probably already aware, like we'll use Franklin Street as an example. Um, in the past, there've been numerous studies that have been done, like many over the last decade. And a lot of times, um, the actual living experience, the human experience hasn't really been taken into account um, because the road may be designated a certain way, which may not really be the right designation, but it creates a negative living experience for the humans there. So I was curious to know if when the study was done and looking in other cities, if that was taken into account because it's an important part of residential living. Thanks, that's really helpful clarification. I might pass this on to Stephanie to answer first, if she's okay with that. I just had to find my unmute button. Um, that is an excellent question, and we didn't necessarily consider it in a um, in a sense of we didn't not we did not interview residents as part of this study. It's something that could be done uh, in the future related to any um, future positive truck route analysis. Um, but we did do the stakeholder engagement uh, in the beginning part of the study where we reached out to um, the ANCs for their input on the study and their experience with truck routes. We did also incorporate some of the findings from um, previous DDOT freight studies and the MOVE DC plan. Uh, that was an important component of evaluating where there might be current issues with that lived experience uh, because folks were very generous with their um, input for those previous studies like MOVE DC and sharing um, how truck traffic impacts them or how other aspects of the roadway systems um, impact them and their neighborhoods. Um, and then we, when we did the gap analysis for identifying the appropriateness of roads for trucks, um, we looked at residential land uses, recreational land uses, and institutional land uses. Um, we wanted to minimize any conflicts with residential and, and um, uh, recreational where people are just living their lives. Uh, the intent is to try to keep busy truck traffic out of out of people living their lives um, or minimize it wherever possible. Uh, we looked at safety data. So where are uh, crashes associated with trucks and commercial vehicles throughout the district uh, and looked at, you know, where those concerns might show up uh, related to the network and then um, the other part of the human experience is for the drivers. Um, so one of the um, sort of intents of asking the questions about the positive versus negative signage is what makes it easier for drivers to do the right thing uh, to avoid getting um, getting enforced because that could result um, in points on their licenses, loss of license, and that's a loss of livelihood, which you know most drivers are trying to avoid. Uh, they want to do the right thing. So how can um, a change in signage make that easier for them to do to plan their routes and know where they should and should not be. Um, so I I think it's a great a great question and we take it seriously both from the driver perspective and from the residential perspective. But there's always more questions that can be asked. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Stephanie. The one the one thing I would tack on is the that truck connectivity index that you mentioned in your analysis of existing conditions that gap analysis. Uh, that heavily weighted against any roads that were in neighborhoods. So any of the uh, considerations of the existing routes and those um, that might be considered um, for proposed routes were um, skewed away or weighted against um, na na residential neighborhoods precisely to try to minimize the disruptive impacts of heavy vehicles. Yes, and, and Shoma had mentioned our desk review of the potential routes, and we also went through, um, based on local knowledge and Google Streets view, we went through the streets um, that came up ranked high on the um, the truck accommodation index to double check that what did it look like um, in real life? Was, were there bike lanes? Is it busy with kids? 
you know, what's going on there, or is it more of a industrial area looking at the appropriateness at all levels? Thanks. Great, thank you both. Um, our next question, uh, Stephanie, if you could go back to the benefit cost slide, um, the question is that uh, they do not understand the explanation for why there is a negative cost impact. Um, does it, would like that would that person like to be unmuted to provide a little bit more context? Or sure. Laura, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was going to say, I, th I think I know where Kelly is coming from with this question. Like, why do we have so many negatives? And, and I think the short answer is uh, routing people or routing trucks out of neighborhoods um, tax on a certain amount of extra vehicle miles traveled. And the impacts of those vehicle miles traveled increases emissions, uh, vehicle operating costs and pavement damage. Um, and then the, and then perhaps, and so there's a trade off, like you want, you want the trucks to, uh, to stay out of neighborhoods, but that comes at the cost of on a systematic or system wide basis. Um, perhaps not a huge, but as, uh, enough of an increase in VMT that the overall, um, outcomes are negative on those categories. Perhaps Stephanie, um. You could speak to the safety benefits and, and Kelly, if I've misunderstood your question, feel free to speak up. Sure, um, and so 1 thing that we didn't explain in the slide, because it's very in the weeds is the methodology that we use for this benefit cost analysis comes from the US DOT. It's the same benefit cost analysis methodology used for um, federal grant applications and other. Um, uh, times when you would need to look at the cost effectiveness of a project. So we wanted to make sure that um, DDOT would be able to compare this project apples to apples uh, with other projects with the same methodology. Uh, but what's different about this project is that it's not uh, an infrastructure improvement, um, like say building a new road or uh, building a new bridge that costs tens of millions of dollars. Uh, it's actually a very low cost project uh, in terms of the total capital expenditure. So, um, what, when Laura was mentioning those additional, um, vehicle operating costs due to the additional, uh, truck miles traveled, those can kind of easily come up on the total capital cost of this project. Uh, and then for the safety benefits, um, like I mentioned, we had some lack of data here, um, uh, that can fully verify what we think the safety impacts would be. Um, but the primary arterials where uh, trucks might be moving to, they are higher speed, and so they can have uh, more serious crashes at times. And so that existing crash rate um, could impact the BCA. But again, we don't know what the vehicle miles traveled will be uh, in the end scenario. So it could be positive um, with different assumptions. Thanks. And um, Kelly, we'll go ahead and unmute you now um, if you'd like to add on to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was trying to jump in, but I was muted. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I'm really just not following this. So I'm just going to try to break it down. So the first one change in operations and maintenance costs is going to have an, uh, is, is the change in operations and maintenance costs, is that the benefit or are we talking uh, so it, it could be a benefit or um what's or a, a drawback i guess or, okay so or, or is the way to read this for positive truck messaging as opposed to negative truck messaging and enforcement the change in operations and the maintenance costs has a negative cost impact is that how to say that under an advisory system where you would be basically managing both the restriction signage and the positive truck route signage. Each of those things mm -hmm. in blue is a different sort of category mm -hmm. of, of what you're looking at. Um, and again, um, so the change in operations and maintenance costs would be positive under a mandatory so that the investment and the payoff 
um, so the payoff would be, you know, bigger than the cost or the investment in, in, in making that, uh, installing that sign. Installing. And when you say mm -hmm. mandatory, meaning that they must follow this route, is that right? That's right. Unless they're making a local delivery. And then how do, but how do you, because we can't get them to follow the advisory signage today. Like they, well, we don't have advisory signage today. We only have restriction signage. So okay. right now under restriction signage uh, enforcement, we have to have a sign in the ground uh, in order for any enforcement to take place. Right. Yep. Uh, under a mandatory system, we've ha we would have a sign in the ground on the truck route. And any street that's not with a sign in the ground would be fair game to have uh, MPD or mm. our automated traffic enforcement unit um, set up cameras to mm -hmm. to identify um, through truck traffic. Hmm. Okay. Okay, and so, so when you say with mandatory, it's a positive cost, positive For, meaning worth it? it yeah. Okay. Like the investment, the, the investment's worth it because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a savings in terms of long-term operations and maintenance. And the thing okay. that's not mentioned here in this cost benefit analysis is that if you move to a mandatory system where you put the signs mm -hmm. on the ground on the designated routes, you're, you're relieving residents from the obligation or the effort mm -hmm. of having to ask for a restriction sign in place. Right. For that enforcement right 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 i can see where that would be good okay now going to the next one for safety benefits and again we're talking about um crashes positive truck message positive truck messaging um what's the negative with that i don't understand the negative there so i'm going to attempt and somebody's going to correct me okay um there are different crash characteristics on local streets versus truck route streets. And so um, where there are actually more crashes identified on local streets, um, there are fewer crashes on truck route streets, but they're more severe on truck routes. Mm -hmm. And if you, mm -hmm. so that's, that's one thing. So you, you, you exchange the number of crashes for the potential severity of crashes. Um, the other thing is we don't have a way of normalizing the data to understand um, the overall, for local streets, we don't necessarily have truck or, sorry, vehicle or traffic counts on all local streets. So it's hard to understand of all the, of all the traffic on local streets, um, how many crashes per, per, per car that's traveling do we experience? But we do know that on, on truck routes, because we do have more comprehensive uh, traffic collection. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison because we don't really have sufficient data to understand that, you know, crash per car kind of ratio that we can compare. So there's, there's some squishiness, but, um, with the type of crashes and that extra vehicle miles traveled that a truck might need to make to stay on the route, we're tipping into a negative on safety benefits. Did I get mm -hmm. that right, Stephanie? Yes, exactly right. Mm. Okay. And then, and then the same thing with on. emissions and vehicle operating yeah. costs that if yeah. they're following the approved mandatory routes, it might take them a little bit longer. That's right. And okay. we're not doing ourselves any favors by being so affordable. This, mm -hmm. this, this signage, um, installing a signage is in, in the broad scheme of transportation projects, very cheap. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to sort of, uh, it kind of skews the, the comparison. Um, I guess that, that I think that my again, correct me if I'm wrong. So, so the thing is, it's not an, it's not an easy win. You do, if we went to go, if we went with mandatory and we put the signs along truck routes, I, we believe that we will have greater compliance and we'll have greater 
you know, a flexibility to enforce, and we will reduce um, some of the burdens both on the district government for maintaining signs on all local streets and also on residents for asking for those signs. Um, but the trade off is a little bit more VMT, which comes with consequences. Um, and then the pavement concerns, um, you know, because we've seen this definitely around Ward 5 where, you know, these restricted routes weren't meant to handle the load of all the volume of trucks that are violating. And then we end up with more um, repairs like DC water pipes, gas pipes, things like that we're finding. So how does that get factored in? Because that has to be a contributing factor. That's true. I, maintenance there too, right? You know? Yeah. I'll, I'll let Stephanie speak to this, but my understanding is that the pavement damage is purely a factor of the additional VMT for staying on the truck routes. It may not take mm -hmm. into account the different construction um, mm -hmm. methods for local streets versus um, North Capitol, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. We we weren't able to look at the costs of, um, uh, say, fully fully repairing local streets because uh, we don't, as Laura mentioned, we don't have great data on the truck traffic on those local streets. Um, it's hard to get from uh, physical counts uh, out in the field. They're not often done on local streets unless there's an upcoming project. Uh, and from the uh, private data source that we got, that's from things like cell phone data. Uh, there's just a, much lower volumes overall on local roads. And so some of that data. Um, yeah, and I, I got to say anonymized, I, so it doesn't really show up. I got to disagree with that. I mean, we've been out there many times and like when I've gone out there and counted myself and sent in the videos, we're talking like 50 in a minute, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you're, you're correct. There's absolutely. Yeah, the so on the ground. I wouldn't say yeah. they're lower volumes. I mean, in fact, this is why we've been so uh, outspoken about it is that no matter what, there doesn't seem to be. Um, uh, an incentive to get them to follow the rules, you know, so I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, although I am a positive person, so I'm, I'm open to hearing how we can incentivize. Um, but at the same time, if the incentivizing isn't working, what more can we do to discourage? And one of my questions in the chat was whether MPD offered this up to you guys, because I know in the conversations I've had with them, whenever we asked SOD to come out, one of the suggestions was, why isn't the fine structure changed to be similar to um, the fines on the express lanes for I-495, where it becomes, you know, increasingly to the point where it's not cost effective to do it because they do believe that these truck companies take it into the cost of doing business. Fines are just a normal thing. Definitely, Kelly. Um, that is, oh, to answer your question, uh, we definitely have cut, we've, MPD, um, the motor carrier unit in particular is well aware of this study and supports it, um, would, be, would be supportive of this um, and, um, the enforcement would be an, a, an expansion on the existing ways that we enforce now through cameras in our ATE, um, Automated Traffic Enforcement Unit, and, um, and through our Motor Carrier Safety Unit. Uh, and also, you know, MPD patrol officers are also uh, authorized to, to stop vehicles and, and question them um, about whether they're making a local delivery or not. So those would be the mechanisms. This would just um, end with our coming online soon automated traffic enforcement contract. We will have additional equipment to um, to put towards this effort. And that camera that that camera based enforcement is currently used to enforce truck through truck restrictions. So you know it, it's the same tools, um, but potentially a, a different framework and. And MPD is is aware of this study and its findings. Um, 
In terms of the fine structure, um, DDOT is working um, and perhaps we will have um, a draft rulemaking um, to share that might address some of those concerns. But that is something that we are working on um, separately from this study, understanding that it is a um, ongoing issue that isn't necessarily related to positive truck route signage um, itself, but is, is one of um, truck traffic management in the district. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Kelly, for those questions. Uh, the next question is, while positive messaging is always good, I suspect we will still have violators on our restricted truck routes. So where do we stand with ATE cameras that can address these violations? They're coming. I, I know that um, DDoT's been saying that for a while now, um, but there is, um, a contract that is coming online and it will include camera based enforcement for truck uh, restrictions. And um, we hope to share through the ATE unit uh, updates soon, but that's something that um, we're working closely with the ATE unit to make sure um, moves forward and is implemented as soon as um, that contract is, is live. All right, and the next question is broad, and I think we've touched on it a little, but we can go into it a little more. Uh, just how will enforcement be handled? It will be more of the same. Um, it will be the MPD Motor Carrier Safety Unit and our um, Automated Traffic Enforcement Unit with camera-based enforcement. Now. That's that's what we have in place. That's what we, we, we are planning uh, and preparing to expand with this new ATE contract. And there's certainly nothing stopping us from doing more um, if, if that is not sufficient in the future. But that plus separate initiatives to re-examine fine structures, um, perhaps um, better clarify truck um you know I, I think that there are multiple things that ddot can explore to increase um awareness of and compliance with uh truck traffic management in the district and um and these study findings will help support those efforts great and then i think the next question is a follow-up to that one of if there's a plan for that and if MPD will be on board with actual ticketing. And Elise, I know you asked to be unmuted, so I will go ahead and do that now so you can add any clarifying points to your question. Um, sorry, I just don't see a little hand raising button on my iPad, so I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to go back to what Laura was talking about and try to get some clarity around this because my understanding in dealing with MPD and the SOD unit, um, as we know, there are only six cars for the entire district that can um, go out and ticket. So Laura, unless I misunderstood you, and if I did, I'm sorry, um, I thought I heard you say that MPD could have any officer go out and do ticketing, if, if, if that's what you said. And I don't know that that's exactly true from what I understand, that SOD is really the only ones that can be called out to do that and that they are so, um, like everything, so short-staffed. But um, if you think about it, if there's only six of these special units that are trained to pull trucks over, you know, ask them the questions and then ticket them, that's not even one per ward. So there's already an issue with that. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was brought up that we could, you know, have an understanding that this is an ongoing problem with MPD as well. And it's not necessarily yeah. their fault, but it is a big part of this problem. At least you're right. I, I think um, my understanding is that there are, I mean, perhaps double digit numbers of um, authorities that operate in the district that 
could pull over any vehicle and ask them questions. You know, we're talking park police or secret service and, and, and I, um, but there is only one unit that specializes um, in commercial vehicles that does more than just, um, you know, that has, a, has that in-depth understanding of what those commercial motor carrier um, uh, requirements are. So I think while, I think that's a great point to clarify, while I think any number of enforcement agencies might have the authority to pull over a vehicle, the MPD's motor carrier safety unit is the one that is um, most knowledgeable and uh, trained to perform that type of enforcement for commercial vehicles. And your point is also valid that there is um, staffing constraints um, for that type of enforcement. So it's all the more important um, that we have um, the ATE unit as a supplemental option for enforcement moving forward. All right, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, do we have metrics of truck volumes on restricted truck routes? That's a good question. And I think that we did look at that in our analysis of existing conditions. I, um, I'll let Stephanie speak to how we looked at that and, and saw some of that. Yes, yes, we did. Um, so to reiterate, we used uh, traffic counts provided by DDOT, um, which have the best coverage on those uh, generally higher traffic roads, arterials, expressways, that kind of thing. Um, and we also used a private um, data source called Replica to um, verify that data and get a bit of an expanded picture. Um, and we didn't um, create a separate metrics exactly of truck traffic on uh, restricted routes. Um, but we did see it across the district um, with certain routes being popular as uh, truck cut throughs, even though they were already restricted. So um, it, is an, it is an issue. All right, thanks for the response. Uh, the next question is, would enforcement on non-signed, so no non-truck route, uh, streets require a change in the city legal code? Short answer is yes. If we were to um, implement a, a mandatory truck route framework with positive truck signage, which is the combination that um, uh, comes with the, with the strongest benefits for um, this th through these study findings, um, yes, we would need to change our existing um, regulations to um, provide that um, framework. And that's part of what was looked at at that transition plan where we did analysis of existing policy, well, where the project team did an analysis of the existing policy and um, identified where and what would need to be updated to support uh, that framework moving forward. All right, thank you, Laura. Uh, the next question is, is there a way to ask the mayor to get a budget to increase MPD SOD? Special operations division, I believe that's what SOD is. And I think the motor carrier safety unit is within that. Um, I, I on, uh, with, with um, Kelly here from the council member's office, like I, I think that would be, um, a great question to pose to her. Um, it's something that um, uh, I, I, you know, that would that would be my best recommendation is is to work um, through your representatives to make that request. All right. Thanks, Laura. And now I see that Ralph has hand raised. Uh, Ralph. I'll go ahead and unmute you now for you to ask your question. Go ahead. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Ralph, are you ready to ask your question? OK, 
Okay, we'll come back and see if maybe there's some technology problems. Uh, I think that is it for the questions in the chat and Q&A for now. Um, so if anyone else wants to add in anything else, now would be the time. And again, um, I guess, could, could you flip the, the slide to um, my contact information or the contact information for the DDOT freight program and um, the website where these slides and this uh, rec recording will be um, posted shortly. We welcome additional thoughts and input. Um, these questions, these concerns um, heard from you and from um, industry stakeholders um, like trucking companies, they will be um, reflect, well, incorporated and reflected within the study findings. And, um, and I think through the end of the month, through um, July 31st, we welcome um, any thoughts and any inputs that you um, would like to share by, by, by email. And, um, and I guess this is just to reiterate, this is a study with findings. Um, at the conclusion of this study, there is no, um, there is no direct action. The, the study findings will determine what those next steps are and um, any, any additional steps that the agency will take based on these study findings will include its own um, public outreach process and notification system. So um, this is a beginning of a conversation that we intend to keep having with you as stakeholders and interested um, residents and, and representatives of, of the district. Um, this is certainly not the last you'll hear about um, how we're looking to better understand and manage truck traffic in the district. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think maybe we'll try Ralph one more time. Um, Ralph, we'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. So you are unmuted now. Okay, may still be having problems, so. Email me. <laughs> I wanna thank everybody for um, your time and your uh, questions today. Um, I, we will be sharing these, these slides. Um, next week at the at the earliest we can get them up um so so please stay tuned and we look forward to hearing from you um and we look forward to sharing these study findings um uh, in i guess at the end of september i think that's the plan well with that i wish everyone a lovely evening thank you so much for your time Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Florence. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much.